interesting. Good question. Computers are going to be more and more pervasive in our lives. I think artificial intelligence will become commonplace with computers thinking for us. My kids are nine and seven, and they may never need to read a map. They just rely on their phones and GPS. That's very true. Yeah. And it's sad in a way. And I love maps. I do. Some future generation may never drive because the cars will drive for them. I do think it's possible that people will be augmented with technology like the protagonist who has a CPU installed in his brain. But ultimately, it's hard to predict. I remember reading a quote from someone in the 1890s who argued that New York City would never have a million people because there wouldn't be room for all the horses. (laughs) He couldn't envision cars or subways or skyscrapers, so I'm not even going to pretend I know what's coming. Is this just one off or will there be another book in the future to keep this storyline going? I recently started writing a sequel. I penned about 15,000 words and then stopped. I just wasn't that interested in following the same character again. I think each book I write will be unique, but we'll see. I kept those pages, so maybe one day I'll go back. Do you have any other books coming out soon or any events you'd like our listeners to know about? Earlier this year, I finished finished a second novel, and it's called The Sun Cast No Shadow. It's an urban fantasy and darker than Hunt for the Troll. I'm trying to find a literary agent or independent publisher, but so far no luck. Fingers crossed that someone will be interested in publishing it. All right. Well, we thank Mark very much for sending in those responses to our questions. And submitting his book. And the book was, I would say, it might not be your traditional mystery, and you don't really have to be computer literate. I found the book very compelling. I enjoyed reading it, even though I kind of had to skip over some of the geeky parts. Geeky part. The whole concept of the story was excellent. It was very well done. Well, and I think sometimes we need to challenge ourselves to get out of our own box and read something a little different. And this was definitely different for us. Yeah, it was a good book. There is a troll. I will tell you that. There is a real honest to goodness, eight foot tall ugly troll, but he wears Versace suit. Interesting. He's Now we will get into the third and final part of our Very exciting. We have a return visit from one of our authors, Nick Vanderlee, who was the author of the book on the murder of Vincent Van Gogh. He reached out to us to ask if we would be willing to give this next book, which is very hot in the headline. Two-Face, The Man Underneath Christopher Watts, and then the second installment is Two-Face, Beneath the Oil. We would like to re-welcome Nick Vanderleek, who was the author who appeared on our podcast a month ago about the murder of Vincent Van Gogh. He is visiting us again today because he has written the book on the case of Chris Watts, the man in Colorado who is accused of killing his entire family. His defense is that he killed his wife, yes, but because she had strangled his children. Do you have any more insight on what's happening with the case now, Nick? Wow. (laughs) Where to begin? Well, I guess for starters, in the last 10 days or so, I've posted 42 blogs on crimerocket.com. There's quite a lot of insight there in terms of the the crime scene, in terms of things like doors and keypads and windows and the layout of the house and so on and so on. A lot of sort of of up-to-the-minute information is on the blog, which is sort of basically entirely dedicated to the Watts case. Um, I have been updating it virtually every day. Yesterday, there was actually a a new motion filed by the defense, a three-page, 15-bullet motion. Curiously, not objecting to disclosure of the autopsy, but but wanting to know what the prosecutor's reasons were for not wanting to taint potential witnesses. Their argument is basically, who are these people whose minds could be changed if the autopsy results are released? They want to actually be given that information ahead of trial. So interestingly, they're not objecting to to 
the release of the autopsy information, they objecting to not knowing who the potential witnesses are, which is quite interesting. Huh, interesting. He is portrayed in your book, and I guess in real life, as kind of a real low life. But she was no prize package either. Well, I'm not sure if I portrayed him as a low life, just as much as kind of a, a kind of introverted guy and a guy who sort of had his own sort of inner world. Uh-huh. And I think what I've tried to do with the book is try and answer the question, sort of, who is this guy? Where does he come from? What's actually going on in his interior? world, what's important to him? You know, if his family is not important to him, what is important to him? I've recently put photos of the alleged mistress on Crime Rocket blog and what's quite interesting with those pictures are they all of a woman who seems to be the life of the party. She seems to be very extrovert. She seems to be very youthful and enjoying sort of being out. I'm not sure whether that's him. It might be him trying to overcompensate, but he is quite an introverted guy and the more I've studied the I call them the Sermon on the Porch, but the more I've studied those interviews that he gave, the more one can actually tell that he generally stutters. He's quite a nervous guy, he's quite a retiring guy. We see that in, in almost all Shanann's videos. He's sort of in the background, he really doesn't say much. And I think the murders were probably the most authentic moment in terms of him. In other words, it's him, obviously a horrible way to do it, but stepping forward and basically making his presence felt in a terrible and tragic way. I think a lot of the, the murder speaks to the idea of someone who's crushed in, who's held back. Some of it's himself holding himself back. Back. Maybe it's his upbringing, whatever it is. Maybe it's his roots. Maybe it's the work situation he's in. But there's no doubt that he's a person who's sort of feeling the need to be introverted. He's feeling the need to be secretive about something. I think if you look at Shanann, she was actually quite similar to him in a way for a long time as well. She was also introverted when she was younger. She was also teased and insecure and so on and so on. And she changed a lot during their marriage, whereas I'm not sure whether he he did. I think he also did, but I think she changed much more. And I think this caused like a mismatch and a schism. And so he was now being more exposed more and more by her endless Facebook. And I think that's a very important aspect. We look at it and we say, well, so what? She was on Facebook. I don't think any of us are on as part of our work and as part of our job and as part of our livelihood. And then also trying to sell something that's not necessarily going to work out as a career. You know, like multiple level marketing tends to be unsuccessful in by far the majority of cases so she was selling I think it was quite desperate I think that's that aspect's not addressed in the mainstream narrative is that they were both desperate to make it in their lives in Colorado and her desperation was actually drawing him out of himself against his will you know he was being exposed how do you feel about me being pregnant for the first time he's got to sort of perform in front of the camera how do you feel about me saying you're this wonderful husband and father and there's a relentless exposure and I think he was the kind of person who wanted to be private but I think she was just engrossed in this company that she worked for how long do you think it would have been if he hadn't killed her before everything crashed down on them because they were right on the brink I think I think they were right on the brink. I don't think there's even a need to answer that question. I think it's, it wasn't a question of if, it was a question of, I mean, it was inevitable. The fact that they were going to have to go to court to deal with fine on their home one week later, I think is significant. I also think it's significant that when Chris Watts gave an interview, he actually spoke in the past tense of his children saying, this was um, August the 14th, the Tuesday. Was so, this on the porch? Yeah, and he was basically just saying that Bella was supposed to go to kindergarten but you're speaking in the past tense. Already then he was kind of acknowledging that the children are no longer alive. The fact that Bella was going to go into kindergarten, I think also um, presented another expense that's besides the pregnancy as well. As soon as your children start going to school regularly, it becomes a regular expense as well. Well, I really like how you said that that was his first authentic moment. I think that it really takes us to what kind of person he was or is and as murder being an authentic moment that really describes it yeah i think another aspect that's all a mystery is is he bisexual or not i mean he's admitted to actively having an affair in my experience with true crime you never have voluntary disclosures that are 
compromising in some way without that disclosure distracting you from some more pertinent reality. He didn't need to say that. He didn't need to say that he and Shanann argued and you know they were going to have a separation and he was having an affair. He didn't need to mention the affair. He could have just said, I wasn't happy with Shanann and about the separation. I think once you've got to look at, this was a particularly sadistic crime. You know, it's different to a crime where someone kills their entire family and then themselves. Right. It was a sort of suicidal, depressed, hopeless scenario. This is a case where he kills, we know his wife, but let's say theoretically he annihilated his entire family. It appears that he, he then wanted to carry on with his life as usual. He wanted to continue living in his home without them. In other words, he wanted to replace the family with the house, basically. Yeah. And, and you might say, well, but how could he have held on to the house? Well, he could have had his mistress live with him and she could help pay with the bills and, and that way they, someone else getting a regular income may have been more than whatever Shanann was earning. Yeah. So I think the to address this idea of why was it necessary for it to be so sadistic? Why did the children even need to die? Why couldn't he just have gotten divorced? You've got to answer those questions because if you don't, then you're basically going into any scenario in everyday life that applies to any other man and woman in any other family. So you say, well, that their finances were poor. Well, so what? A lot of people have financial difficulties and no one murders anyone. What if they didn't love each other anymore? Well, people get divorced. It doesn't need to end in murder. What if the children were too much for him? Same thing, divorce. Right. So you want to look at something that was unique in the situation that in his mind, not in our minds, in his mind, necessitated this exit strategy. And I've spent quite a lot of time in the second book trying to address a lot of that in a chapter called Lock In. And I mentioned all the ways that I felt that he was locked in where he he felt he didn't have a choice. How far ahead do you think he planned this murder? The research I did on Scott Peterson seemed to show that it went back months. If you look at the way that he bought the boat and the way that he hogged the jewelry, it's not just what he did before the crime, but also after. You know, if you commit a catastrophic crime like that and then the next day you straight face, you're fine. You shouldn't have the psychological distance where you can say, wow, I'm in a nightmare. I don't know how to get out of it. If you're innocent, you not going to think of it as a nightmare in such a simple way the next day. I mean, it won't even be a nightmare for you because you're not even sure what's happened to them. If it is premeditated, then your nightmare started much earlier and the murder is part of how he's trying to get out of the nightmare. Right. Does that make sense? Right. Yes, it does. My main question is the children being left in mm-hmm. a vat of oil. Did the oil preserve their bodies enough that they can tell whether they had drugs in their system? There's not much about the autopsy. Well, that's that's another mystery. A lot of people have criticized Chris Watts as being the world's dumbest criminal and that he (laughs) didn't think anything out. And I think a lot of people don't actually recognize the unusual circumstances of someone arriving at the house just after crimes being committed and not just looking in, but actually calling the police with, with very little to go on. Nicole Atkinson called the police with virtually nothing to go on, maybe just gut instinct. And she was right. Uh But people don't realize that was very exceptional. And there were other things as well, like the fact that cops brought in dogs immediately. I mean, look at the John Bonet Ramsey case. Dogs were not brought in at all. In the Madeleine McCann case, it took them three months to bring in dogs. In the Casey Anthony case, they actually brought dogs in quite early, but they didn't do much with with the information because they were waiting for Casey to tell the truth, which she basically never did. But the dogs also confirmed that people have died. There were tracking dogs, but there were also cadaver dogs. Yes. So the dogs basically confirmed someone has died. In terms of the oil, I think the difficulties, it's, I don't think there's a DNA case whatsoever. I think it's most important item of evidence is going to be whatever is supposed to point to time of death. If the time of death is shown to be for the children, early in the day or early in the evening, then it's going to point to Chris Watts. And if it's later, it's going to be harder to disprove his allegation. Right. So one thing I haven't been able to find information on, I'm still digging, I'm still researching, is what impact would crude oil have on stomach content? One's also got to ask, would the oil go into the mouth and would it enter the body? They were immersed in this oil for four days. That's quite a long time. Yes. And the oil tank is in the sun and it was summer. So the that as well is going to speed up the chemical process of decomposition and contamination. This is a very unique case. You know, I haven't dealt with a scenario like this. What is the possibility of the food, the digestive tract being secure space compared to the oil? Right. Uh, I have looked at other cases that are not oil, but there's one case where a woman and her dog were dumped into a cesspit under her home. And they only found her, I 
think three months later. The only evidence of any forensic value was her hair. And yet what they were able to find from her were varying levels of a sedative called Zopiclone in her hair. And what they were able to establish from that was that she'd been progressively drugged, uh, probably without her knowledge. And she was a writer and she was also taking this medication anyway. So them finding it in a system didn't necessarily mean anything. They found it huge amounts in her hair, but sort of going from a certain low amount and then increasing to way more than they needed to be.